On today's featured crime analysis, we take a closer look at fetal abduction. In episode 9, you may remember, we covered the heartbreaking case of Savannah Graywind, who was murdered when she was eight months pregnant by an upstairs neighbor named Brooke Cruz. Brooke Cruz lured Savannah to her apartment, strangled her to death, cut the baby out of her womb, and pretended to have just delivered a new daughter. She was quickly caught. The baby luckily was unharmed and returned to the biological father, and Brooke will now spend the rest of her life in prison. I was really sad to learn that a similar crime occurred on April the 23rd of this year when pregnant 19-year-old Marlon Ochoa Lopez was strangled to death by 46-year-old Clarissa Figueroa and her 24-year-old daughter Desiree. Marlon died and her baby suffered irreversible brain damage during this crude delivery. Fetal abduction, though, as this type of crime is known, is extremely rare. Out of 4 million births in the U.S. alone each year, there have only been 35 documented cases so far worldwide where women have attempted to forcibly remove fetuses from expectant mothers with the intention of passing off the babies as their own. As rare as they are, though, there does seem to be a pattern to these crimes. In most cases, the perpetrator has been lying about being pregnant for months. She's told friends she was pregnant. She's told her family she was pregnant. She may have faked positive pregnancy tests, sonograms, and doctor's visits. She may have purchased baby clothes or decorated a baby's room. As you can see, there's a great deal of planning and manipulation that has already gone into this charade. So why in the world would somebody do something like this? Well, a 2002 study from the Journal of Forensic Science found two main motives for fetal abduction attacks. Number one, to keep a partner, and number two, to act out some kind of childbearing and delivery fantasy. And it's important to realize that this is not about being a mom or about raising a child. It's just the baby is really just a means to an end here. As in the Savannah Graywin case, some of these women start the pregnancy lie in order to cement the, their relationship with the man. So for a time at least, the pregnancy or the pretend pregnancy takes the attention away from the conflict or the lack of commitment that the woman thinks is threatening the relationship. And you know what's interesting is that many of the involved men who really think that their partner is pregnant will swear that they witnessed physical changes in the woman's body. Her stomach got larger, her feet swelled up, and so forth. They're not, however, involved in the actual prenatal care, like doctor's visits. Sometimes this is by choice, and sometimes it's because the woman finds a way to keep her partner from attending. And of course, in addition to the agenda of keeping or solidifying a relationship with a man, there are the normal per perks of pregnancy. So there's the emotional support, the interest in the details of the upcoming baby, and so forth. This is certainly a huge added or even sometimes primary incentive. Just like the pregnancy is planned or the hoax is planned, the actual abduction is also carefully planned. In almost every case, the perpetrator acts alone almost always using some form of deception when she establishes contact with her victim. So for example, she might claim to be pregnant too and bond about this. She might offer her free baby clothes or furniture. She may befriend the victims weeks or months in advance. She also tends to research cesarean sections from a library book or the internet because of course the plan is to personally do it, a, a kind of a crude C-section to get this baby. You know, while we might be able to relate to the desperate need to hold on to a crumbling relationship or the need to get sympathy or attention from others, it's really almost impossible to understand how a woman could go from faking a pregnancy for whatever reason to committing a horrible crime. I mean, even someone who goes into a maternity ward and kidnaps a baby is really different from this perpetrator who is willing to commit murder to get what she wants. However, the women in most of these cases are not psychotic. They have not lost touch with reality. As a matter of fact, they're conducting fairly elaborate pregnancy scams that indicate a decent grasp of what's going on. So when you look at a woman who's willing to commit this sort of organized crime in order to get what she needs, she may have a serious personality disorder, but she probably does not have a major mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. 
One of the strangest things about these cases is that these women never seem to think beyond the actual attack. Every single one of these women is easily caught. And of course, when you think about it, this makes sense. I mean, it might be fairly easy to convince a boyfriend that you're pregnant, but you are not going to convince a doctor that you've just given birth. And also, a genuinely pregnant woman who suddenly vanishes is someone who is going to be quickly missed by friends and family and more likely to be taken seriously when she's reported missing to the police. So when we look at these kind of cases, there's really not much for us to worry about when we're pregnant. I mean, that actual likelihood of this happening is so incredibly rare. I do think, though, there are few points to remember here. And one being, of course, to trust your instinct, whether you're pregnant or not. And this just means that if you have a strange feeling about someone, if you meet somebody or someone approaches you and she shows an unusual interest in your pregnancy, just pay attention to that. Also, if you meet an acquaintance and she asks you to come to her house alone, take a friend with you. Of course, we can think of this as even a bigger picture lesson. We don't have to be pregnant to realize that when our intuition tells us something isn't right, we really should try to act on it. And if pieces of a puzzle are coming together, but we can't quite fill all the holes in, we should still pay attention to it. And we might need to do this by sharing this information with other people we trust, uh, a friend, a parent, even the police, and others who might be able to help us. Who cares if it's awkward or uncomfortable or we're afraid of being embarrassed by being wrong in these situations? If we don't listen to our our intuition or we ignore it, eventually we might lose a very important gift that our bodies and our minds give us that allow us to protect ourselves from things that aren't right.